Thank you very much, Fair uh, and Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. So many cephologists in one room. Uh, there are lots of people to thank for what today you'll see is the beginning of a project. Uh, Pippa Norris, who is listening in Cambridge at this very moment, uh, uh, for her initial push and help with this uh, funding this project. To Lisa and Ferran, uh, thank you very much. To Iona Rennie, who is somewhere in the room, who at SDN is currently in the middle of the room, currently um, uh, uh, coordinating uh, our part of the project, which we hope will become a book project, which has a partner at the WZB in Berlin. Uh, we will have uh, our brainstorm workshop at the end of October here. Anybody who is interested, please do get in touch. And there will be a follow-up Berlin workshop uh, sometime in the middle of December when Pippa will do the pre-Christmas lecture at the WZB. And to Stephen, thank you very much for so of professionals fame, professionally offering yourself up for uh, a fairly wild presentation. I uh, wanted to begin by asking uh, what historians will say, let's say 50 years from now, about elections, about whether there is a long-term shift going on in the culture and dynamics of elections and their significance seen globally, whether a big picture approach of the kind that I'm going to lay out today, very much as work in progress, can help us get to some very fundamental questions such as, are elections with integrity do they have a future? Do they still matter? Can, they be re can elections be rejuvenated? Or, the subversive question, could it be when viewed in the long durée, in terms of a longer history, could we say that elections are, are slowly losing their grip on democracies as we know them? Are they in terminal decline, as some observers are beginning to say? Is the universal belief in free and fair elections, a late 18th century to, let's say, a mid 20th century delusion that is becoming a worn out dogma and actually in need of replacement by other kinds of institutions that will keep the spirit and the institutions, uh, the power dynamics of democracy alive. This is the big question and in this project, which is very much in its early uh, phases, I uh, want to say something about the methods that are supposed here in the remarks that I'm making. Something like an engaged global history of the future of elections might be the pompous way of putting it. It's not antiquarianism that I'm interested in. And in fact, uh, what's needed as far as I can see is a cross-disciplinary mixed methodology of, uh, of, uh, of uh, approaches that can get at these uh, big questions, and they include historical interpretation. I mean, things that uh, seem eternal are never so. And this is true for uh, elections, uh, which have a history. The whole idea that uh, representative democracy, meaning free and fair elections in the territorial state setting are the heart and soul of democracy, is of course a late 18th century invention. Why should it be timeless? It's one of the, the insights I think one can get by thinking historically about elections. What I have to say today pays attention to language. Uh, language of course shapes the way we see the world and that's true for the language of elections. Some of you may know that uh, in the very opening pages of the life and death of democracy I point out that the family of terms through which we think about elections all have a history, and what's astonishing, really, is that the language, the familiar terms in our vocabulary of elections, resemble something like a magpie's nest of, of different terms with disparate origins. Briefly, the word election first appears uh, in around 1600 from the Latin, meaning to choose to pick out. The word electorate doesn't appear until 1879. Electors comes later. The word franchise is a medieval word uh, referring to freedom or exemption from servitude or domination. 
the whole notion of voting is a Scottish contribution. The word is a Scottish contribution around 1600. Uh, the word poll, uh, I understand, comes from Old Dutch and German origins, from dialects, and it means it refers to a head. To poll someone actually means to cut someone's head off. Uh, polling is a practice where you count votes by presenting uh, heads. Candidate, as we all know, comes from candidatus, meaning clothed in white. The thought that candidates are pure and as white as sugar are rather greats today, uh, as does the strange word ballot, which comes from belotta, uh, an Italian word referring to a black ball in a voting exercise. I mean, it's not to show off, it's just to say that the terms that we, that we use when thinking about elections are themselves historical and they have uh, eclectic oranges and we should pay attention to the changing language of elections and, for example, in the post-1945 period, many of the neologisms that have appeared, permanent campaign, party hopping, hanging chads, spin. And I think um, we are uh, here, uh, close to Antarctica, can claim dog whistling, uh, announceables, informal voting, which I think probably has older origins, and of course election sausage sizzles. These are all terms that have been added to the vocabulary of language. <laughs> there is then uh, the point that um, uh, concepts really matter. And you'll see that what I'm wrestling with here is uh, uh, the prevailing terms, conceptual terms through which elections are conceived, and asking the question, questions about whether fresh, wilder concepts are needed to make sense of the big changes probably that are going on uh, in our times. And finally, not to be underestimated are uh, the importance of a global perspective on things and above all don't forget uh, data. Now I'm not good at data but I want to uh, say uh, that uh, this project certainly uh, will draw upon uh, banks of data of all kinds. Uh, what uh, the project I think however wants to say is that that data can only uh, so to say, uh, you can only make sense of this data in terms of a long durée, in terms of a longer history, paying attention to language, pay attention, attention to the historicity of things. Have a look at this. Uh, this is a graph of turnout in the United Kingdom uh, from 1945 until 2015. What does this mean? What do these trends mean? Is this trendless fluctuation, uh, as Pippa might suggest, or does, it have, uh, does this graph have other meanings? These uh, kinds of questions, it seems to me, depend upon uh, other uh, frameworks in which, which I'm using as part of my methods. I want to uh, now move to uh, a bias, so to say, in this project. The project concentrates on development since 1945. Why 1945? You will know that in the summer, spring summer of that year, there were only a dozen parliamentary democracies left on the face of the earth. Um, the historic post-18th and post 1918 struggle for parliamentary democracy in territorial state settings largely failed. There were 12 uh, left, uh, including, uh, some of them are a stretch, Finland, for example. Um, but since that time, as many uh, have pointed out, some astonishing things have happened in the history of elections. Here, prepared by Maria Fotu in London for the History of Democracy project is a graph, as global as it can be, of when men in light grey and women in dark grey uh, receive the vote, all adult men and women. And you will see, of course, that uh, women's, uh, the extension of the universal franchise principle to women comes much later. Uh, but there is a big bunching that goes on in, in the 1910s and 20s and 30s and 40s. So one reason for concentrating on the post-45 period is the period in which the struggle for a universal franchise is, so to say, finished off. This is also the period in which, um, as you know, uh, in the Electoral Integrity Project, there are many statements of the universality of the principle of free and fair elections. Here is uh, Article 21. Uh, of uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights that puts in not altogether good grammar uh, the principle that democracy is essentially about free and fair elections and a universal and equal suffrage. This presumption that elections 
are at the heart of democracy, crystallizes in this post-45 period, uh, I think for the first time, and it's backed up by the kinds of graphs you see here from Freedom House, uh, which uh, uh, I think is fairly self-explanatory. You see a general trend in the dark line towards free, uh, free polities in which um, the universal franchise, uh, free and fair elections with integrity prevail. That is the pattern that uh, Freedom House and other bodies emphasize. What is striking when you look at things historically about this period is that is the way in which the reticence about uh, voting more or less disappears in this period. Uh, I could quote to you uh, Henry Sumner Main's famous uh, passage in a book called Popular Government in the 1880s where he said, if universal suffrage had happened, we would never have had the spinning jenny, we would never have had the power loom, we would never have had the threshing machine, never the Gregorian calendar, uh, etc., etc. Um, and all through the 19th century and into the early 20th century, this kind of prejudice against voting, uh, the universality of uh, elections, is, 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 is striking. This withers away after 1945, and so whether it's Joseph Schumpeter, or it's Bernard Berelson, or Adam Jaworski, or Frank Fukuyama, or Samuel Huntington, everybody emphasizes that elections, most scholars emphasize that elections are the heart and soul of democracy within territorial state settings. I'm very struck, and I think this project ought to look at the darker side and the silences of this consensus, this orthodoxy. For example, um, one of the striking things about the struggle for the universal franchise uh, from the end of the 18th century is that many new institutions were born in order to back that demand uh, of one person, one vote. Free press, rights of assembly, the right to strike, the right to form a trade union. I mean, all of these institutions uh, were, were seen as vital for the struggle for the universal franchise. The question is, what kind of equivalent institutions have been built since 1945? Uh, scholars are typically silent about that matter. Or, another instance of uh, the dark side orthodoxy, if you read, as I have been uh, doing, Calvino's wonderful essay called The Watcher, La giornata d'uno scrutatore, uh, is set in a hospital in Torino, and uh, in a hospital for incurables, where he spends a day as, a, uh, as an election monitor. And one of the things he says in this remarkable essay is that elections have become a sort of religious right in our time. That is, they are sort of modeled on the act of praying. Uh, it's as if voting is becoming part of God, as he says it, as he puts it, um, where we accept human smallness, hoping that our own nothingness melds into something much bigger to a final unknown end. Uh, what he's saying in this essay is uh, unpopular, but he's saying that you know we're living in times in this post-45 period where the election becomes a sort of religious ritual. And why is that the case? Because it was never uh, uh, seen uh, uh, in other societies in that way. And there are other silences that it seems to me a project on the post-45 period should address. For instance, um, why is it that almost no research is carried out on the 1947 and 1948 elections in China? Uh, which, of course, uh, produced a civil war and a polity in 1949 that does practice a sort of phantom form of elections, but where the whole struggle for the universal franchise was actually defeated. Uh, one could say, if one looked at this as an historian, that this is the moment where things begin to go badly, but that is usually not discussed. And, of course, um, this is a period in which a lot of hypocritical things, this is... Uh, a famous cartoon by uh, Kato Etsuro, one of the famous Japanese cartoonists from 1946. The Japanese, I'm told, reads, Democracy by Parachute. Uh, and, of course, you know uh, this. Uh, if you've been to my home, you will know that I have a fridge magnet that says, Be kind to America, otherwise democracy will be brought to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, Peter Sloterdijk's um, satirical pneumatic parliament. This is a reference to the way that, you know, elections are brought in by aircraft um, bombers. And the pneumatic parliament is uh, designed, he's a 
Dutch-German philosopher who satirically thinks that what the Americans should have done in Afghanistan and Iraq is actually fly these pneumatic parliaments and you blow them up and within an hour you've got a parliament and you, you, know, you can kickstart democracy. Of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, satirical. Um, so, much for the orthodoxy. I want to talk about the counter trends in this post-45 period. What I'm trying to get you to think of is you know, what sense can we make of the trajectory of elections in our time? What is happening to elections uh, at the global level? What sorts of uh, considerations would have to be taken into account to decide whether there is a changing function and significance of elections? Well, one set of considerations, I move to them now, is to look at the decline and displacement of elections typically at the general uh, territorial state level. There are some big trends that I think you can see when you look, uh, when you adopt this long durée uh, perspective. The first and most striking, uh, most obvious, not most striking, the first is the way in which the public passions that fed the struggle for the universal franchise clearly uh, decline. Uh, this is um, uh, Nathan Hughes's famous painting of uh, uh, a riot that develops at Hyde Park in London uh, in the 1860s in defense of the principle of uh, one man, one vote. The question is, uh, what happened to this passion? What, to put it differently, analogous to the way um, women uh, have for some time been struggling with the question, what happens after you get uh, the vote? The question, I think, the first trend is that once the struggle for one person, one vote is achieved, where do the passions go? Uh, and here, the first person I came across to raise this question was Norberto Bobbio, I think Italy's greatest post-45 uh, democratic theorist, who wanted to say that um, this period, historically, is no longer a period defined by the question of who votes, but where people vote. That is the new shift, um, and it follows from this, that something like a desacralization of the universal franchise uh, has been taking place. Second trend. Uh, there is, uh, There are various ways of putting this second trend, but let's call it the changing ecology of representation. Now, um, there are conflicting interpretations of a shift that seems to me to be going on in which elections are being supplemented, sometimes outflanked by, sometimes replaced by uh, forms of politics that do not uh, depend upon elected representation. Pierre Rosenvallon, uh, for example, has um, written a very interesting book uh, on the growth, the spread of unelected authority. That is, forms of the institutions that have authority in the eyes of the public, even though they're not elected. Or one could uh, look at Bruno Latour's Ding Politik. I'm happy to talk about that. I have no time to, to, to uh, go into anything uh, in much detail, but the one um, that I've the approach that I've tried to pursue in my work, as you know, is this monetary democracy, courtesy of Giovanni Navaria, who is here. Um, this slide sort of summarizes a shift that it seems to me taking place in which elections are um, partly uh, now operating and probably operating more and more in a different ecology of representation of multiple institutions, multiple representatives, um, multiple voting, uh, a much more complicated uh, uh, political dynamic than the universal franchise model of democracy supposed. Uh, one little um, uh, hint at uh, the change that's going on, I count more than 100 monetary institutions that have been invented since 1945. Many, many of them are unelected. Uh, some of them do practice in-house elections, but they change the dynamics of democracy. One case in point, I looked in vain in most of the journalism of the last couple of weeks on the Volkswagen uh, defeat device fraud. Uh, if you um, trace back where this began, 
It actually began with an NGO, a not-for-profit NGO called the International Council on Clean Transportation, that was contracted by the California legislature to look into Volkswagen and discovered that actually they were cheating and then went um, to the Justice Department and the Environmental Protection Agency and so began a global scandal that uh, at the very least has humbled Volkswagen and might seriously uh, weaken its business, uh, uh, whole business model in the years to come. This is somehow becoming more and more typical that it's not elections and parties and parliaments that that cause, uh, uh, that expose corruption scandals of this kind. It is monetary institutions that uh, do the work uh, that elections in some quarters uh, are thought uh, uh, properly uh, to do. Uh, there is a, uh, a third trend, which is, um, and there are many people in this room who know much better uh, these things and have done uh, a lot of really interesting work, and it's the growth of extra-parliamentary civic initiatives and, and social movements of one kind or another. Uh, among the very first, probably the first, is the civil rights movement in the United States outside the party system, uh, develops um, uh, a lot of new mechanisms, the sit-in, um, the freedom ride, the sing-in, the mock election, um, a minority that is hopelessly outnumbered in electoral terms, but manages to begin a dynamic um, from, uh, from civil society and having long-term electoral and, uh, and, of course, legal effects. And one could say that in this post-45 period that one of the striking things is that every great uh, public issue from racism to um, freedom from nuclear um, destruction to the student movement, to the rebirth of the women's movement, to the greening of politics, to the politics of disability, all of those themes that now appear in every actually existing democracy uh, on the agendas of parties and parliaments and governments, all of those um, originated from outside the electoral dynamic. So um, here is a third uh, trend. I think there is uh, a fourth uh, big trend. All of these, it seems to me, are serving to displace elections, to take the sting out of the tail of elections, to reduce the passion for elections. And the fourth trend, Pippa has written, I think, very helpfully about the importance of thinking about elections in terms of modes of communications. And um, the brief uh, story that uh, Pippa wants to say is that there's a big shift that's been going on in the post-45 period towards the centralization of party media strategies, initially through the use of television and uh, professionals um, who dictate the terms and conditions of an election campaign towards what she calls a postmodern uh, dynamic in which actually the professionals really run the campaign um, of parties um, and where because of a shift of, of the mode of communications from centralized uh, distribution, radio, television on the left, through to digital network media, uh, electorates themselves become tetchier, less predictable, uh, more promiscuous, more prone to withdraw uh, their support for established parties. In short, um, Pippa's suggestion is, and I, uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, highly important, that um, uh, all's not well in the house of uh, electoral uh, democracy, and it leads to all kinds of um, almost mythologization of the trends. This is uh, a painting by uh, an American uh, a Latvian scholar and painter Zita Zodaika. This is the politician. This was done at a very early point before it became um, orthodoxy to attack uh, politicians. And there are many jokes that go with this uh, trend. Uh, during an election campaign, the air is full of speeches and vice versa. If the gods had intended for people to vote, they would have given us candidates. Do you ever get the feeling that the only reason we have elections is to find out if the polls were right? And so on. None of you thought they were very funny, but anyway. 
Um, and of course, populism feeds on this, and, uh, uh, and I don't want to go on because I want to mention the fifth trend. Not a lot is written about this among democratic theorists. This is Deutsche Bank, its headquarters in Frankfurt, it's designed to sort of put you back a bit in your seats. Um, there are signs that no matter what election outcomes are, uh, the incumbent government has to acknowledge, defer to, uh, be vetoed by, uh, issue respect for, and offer policies that favour structural trends that undermine the meaning of elections. I think that um, this project, I hope, will have someone who looks at um, the militarisation of democracies. You don't have to read Gore Vidal to see uh, you know, his novels on uh, the growth of the militarised American Republic to see that actually the militarisation of American democracy uh, ties the hands of any elected uh, president. Um, the one example that uh, I have looked at is the rise of what we could call uh, banking states, and I'll just put this very uh, crudely. Uh, this is a, a, a graph uh, from, uh, of the UK. I mean, we always think, or we typically think, of elected, democratically elected governments as in command of taxation and money. In fact, the historical trend is dead against that. So that what is going on, whether in Germany or the United States or the UK, uh, and I suspect Australia is included in this trend, is that the banking and credit sector more and more uh, commands the production and circulation of money. And this means that any project, any mega project, for example, transportation or new forms of um, post-carbon technology, you have to negotiate with them to get the money in order to, do, uh, to carry out the project. And this rise of the banking state, as I called it, seems to me to have, um, it, casts, uh, it, it casts a very large question over the centrality of elections because the old presumption was that elections grant sovereign power to a government. But that cannot be so in a context where um, zones of life um, are increasingly um, uh, make elections marginal. And the sixth and final trend I want to point to um, there are scholars in this room who do work on electoral authoritarianism. I prefer electoral despotism, but um, one thing that is clear in this post-45 period is the rise of states that use elections um, to defeat uh, parliamentary democracy. They, in a way, uh, teach us that elections beyond democracy um, are possible, they raise questions about whether, in fact, elections, free elections, might be dying. I know the data is controversial on this, but think of it in this way. If you look at the geographic concentration of these despotisms, all of which practice elections, they are heavily concentrated in this uh, Eurasian region of the world. And one question that I hope this project uh, will address, something that I'm hoping to do in a little book on despotism, of the 21st century is um, the growth of regimes. Uh, Tajikistan, Saudi, Russia, China, where elections are practiced, but they are not practiced according to the textbook rules of representative democracy, and they do pose the question of what indeed uh, an election is. Now, I want to draw this uh, to an end, um, not by cheering you up, but by looking at some counter-counter trends. Because it seems to me that this project, this project on the future of elections, this attempt to think about the history of the future of elections, ought also uh, de to deal with uh, some trends, some real trends of our times that seem to point to efforts to um, breathe life back into elections. The question is whether there is something of a renaissance of um, representative electioneering going on. One thing is uh, clear, there's lots of tinkering that is happening in a variety of contexts. For instance, the House of Commons in the UK has reclaimed war powers. No government can go to war unless the House of Commons so approves. Or 
think of Hillary Clinton's current campaign for automatic universal voter registration. It's a form of resistance to a 2013 Supreme Court decision that, uh, that now uh, makes it easier for states to decide their own electoral laws and practices without regard to the Justice Department. Or think of the banning of party hopping in Brazil. Or think of uh, the struggles that are emerging around campaign donations and the poisoning of elections by money. These are tinkerings, it seems to me, that um, are important. But they are not so important as uh, some other uh, trends that seem to me to feed uh, uh, something like a renaissance of elections in our own time. I have no idea for how long I've been going on, for, uh, probably too long, but I stop in, in five minutes. If you can do three. Sorry? Three. Oh, right. Okay. Then I kangaroo hop through a few <laughs> points. Counter trends. The political geography of elections is changing. The spread of electoral democracy to all kinds of so-called non-Western contexts is a fact of the post-45 period, whether it's India or Sierra Leone or Bhutan or Taiwan or Iran. And what is interesting is that when elections happen in these contexts, uh, there is the joy of founding elections. I would like to say a lot more about joy and elections, but there is no time. Second trend. Uh, we see the spread of cross-border voting. Uh, it's not just that elections are exported by force of arms. There are experiments in, in operating elections at a global level. The Tibetan government in exile does this. The flourishing of diaspora voting. The way in which elections in a national context are now witnessed globally thanks to uh, 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 the communications revolution. The Eurovision Song Contest, European elections, uh, I mean, these are all instances where cross-border uh, voting is spreading. And most organizations, the IOC, the WTO, the Antarctic Treaty System, all rely on elections. These are something new in the history of elections and democracy. Third trend is uh, the whole question of whether political parties can be renewed, I have no time to talk about this, but um, one could learn lots from Ada Kalau and Beppe Grillo and Jeremy Corbyn or say the blackballing campaign in Korea in the year 2000, all of which try against all the odds I've been describing to breathe life back into parties and the importance of representation. There is also um, the fact in our times in the post-45 period that representation, which um, Parquet Simon uh, is, I think, spreading into other domains of life. The greening of representation, the spread of the vote, as it were, to the biosphere, or the spread of the vote to the dead, uh, the whole politics of um, remembering past injustices, the politics of thinking about future generations, in a way one could say, as an historian looking on elections in this post-45 period, that one of the remarkable things is the way that voting is being extended to constituencies that never before had the vote. And these seem to promise uh, a future for elections. And finally, and I finish on this, uh, I return to the opening questions of whether we should be cheered up by these trends, or whether actually what we're witnessing is somehow uh, a long-term displacement of the general election, of parties, of election systems, uh, as ways of deciding who gets what, when, and how in so-called democracies. I spot an emerging debate about the future of elections, and I hope this project will uh, try to capture these trends, and I can see uh, three uh, in particular. One is the view that um, what's now needed is a recapturing of the spirit of founding elections. The joy that comes from knowing that you can wallop a government uh, that has become corrupt and unjust. Uh, there are plenty of instances of this. Um, I would mention Mayawati Kumari in Uttar Pradesh. She won 
four times as chief minister of one of the poorest states in India. Um, flamboyant is uh, a word that hardly captures her style, but she managed to persuade millions of Indian citizens that the vote is still important. And I'm wondering whether this uh, is uh, a trend that we are likely to see. And if we are, whether inevitably disappointment will follow. Let's say according to the Samuel Beckett principle, if you fail, try again and fail better. Uh, this could be one dynamic, uh, despite all of the, the trends and counter trends I've been talking about that uh, awaits us. The second, uh, uh, this is Hong Kong. The second is you know, a resigned, satirical, despairing uh, reaction to the trends that I have been outlining. In his toughest moments, Russell Brand expresses this. Um, maybe it is time uh, to uh, reach for the words of the poet and bury the rag of despair deep in our faces. You have to guess who said that. Uh, but maybe the time is coming to accept that actually elections are no longer and will never again be central to democracy as we know it. And so therefore, we need to find other methods. Third trend, a third um, opinion in this emerging dispute about the future of elections is those who want to take us back to Athens. For example, um, this a person you may never have uh, seen before. I don't know where he's gone back somewhere, disappeared. Uh, he's disappeared. Um, David van Rebroek uh, in the Low Countries in the Nether in, in uh, Europe has put a cat among pigeons, to say the least, by saying that elections are actually killing democracy. And uh, he's a back to Athens guy, but the whole idea is that the fetish of elections, the fixation of elections, the belief that elections can change things is actually having ruinous effects on democracy. Now, um, I uh, uh, will leave you with the thought or the feeling that um, I'm neither for nor against elections, but just the reverse. Uh, and uh, I would be very curious to, to know what you think about this project, which I've sketched. I haven't told you what I think uh, might be a fourth or fifth option, but it does seem to me, final sentence, that any discussion of the future of elections would have to address at least all of these trends, which of course are highly complicated, but they're pretty important because after all, it is still said that elections are at the heart of democracy as we know it and should be at the heart of its future.